Okay, then start the Okay, very good evening. Uh, we'll start our sports uh, team teaching. Uh, very good evening to Mr. Cairo and my fellow colleagues. Okay, so the topic I'm presenting today is shoulder instability. So we start off with an introduction. Uh, shoulder instability is a spectrum of disorder that includes dislocation, subluxation, and laxity of the shoulder joint. Most commonly dislocated joint and also more than 50% of all joint dislocation. This is due to its highly mobile joint, hence it compromise stability. So 95% of all the shoulder dislocations are anterior. Uh, we start out with a bit of anatomy. The shoulder is a ball and socket joint. The humeral head to your glenoid ratio is about 4 to 1. The labrum deepens the articular survey by 50% and increase humeral contact by 75% and also maintains a negative intra-articular pressure. So we have your static and dynamic stabilizer to keep the humeral head centered at the glenite throughout the whole physiological range of motion. So instability factor, basically your humeral head is larger than the glenite. The capsule is strong but it's also lax. So we start out with the static stabilizer which is your glenite labrum, glenohumeral ligament, glenite version, negative intra-articular pressure and adhesion cohesion. Glenite labrum basically deepens like I mentioned earlier. Then your glenohumeral ligament is your superior, middle and also inferior. So it resists anterior subluxation. The superior glenohumeral ligament at neutral position uh, prevent inferior subluxation. Middle at about uh, 45 degree resists anterior translation. And then the inferior at about 90 degree abduction and the anterior band restrain anterior translation. Posterior band maintain the, uh, maintain the st main stabilizer in the internal rotation. So our glenoid is 7 degree retroverted and then the scapula is 30 degree antiverted to the coronal plane of the body to prevent uh, posterior instability. So adhesion cohesion basically is between two wet surfaces due to the viscous and intramolecular properties of the synovial fluid. So next, your dynamic stabilizers are your rotator calf muscle, long head of bicep, and also your scapular rotators. So start some classification. Basically, there's a few classification, but the main one will be your Thomas and Madsen and also Stanmore. So uh, some terminology need to know in uh, classification will be traumatic, atraumatic, Voluntary and involuntary instability, uh, both as known as habitual instability and muscle patterning. So basically, muscle patterning is uh, how the muscles act, um, act synergistically to, to perform a certain movement. So Rockwood, basically, there is four types. The type one uh, is uh, there's a history of traumatic subluxation without a uh, frank dislocation. Type 2, traumatic subluxation with frank dislocation. Type 3, uh, voluntary subluxation of the shoulder without any history of trauma. is subdivided at 3A and 3B. So basically, uh, the patient will voluntarily sublux their shoulder. So one is with psychological problem and 3B is without psychological problem. Then type 4 is basically involuntarily atraumatic subluxation. So it can be difficult to determine if uh, the patient had any history of a traumatic event or whether the uh, dislocation is due to uh, voluntarily or not voluntarily. Thomas and Madsen uh, basically it groups uh, your instability into TUPS and also the Embry group. So TUPS basically stands for traumatic, unidirectional, present or banker lesion and often require surgery. Embry group is basically atraumatic, multi-directional, usually involved bilateral shoulder, and uh, rehabilitation is the main therapy, and then surgical-wise will be inferior capsular shift. So TUPS uh, created based on uh, their experience and findings when they do open anterior repair. They noted there is about 97% got uh, banquet lesion, and another 48% got uh, large heel sac lesion, so they term it as uh, they group it together as tops. Then uh, for this classification, it ignore the concept of uh, muscle patterning and also voluntary instability. This global classification, I think I'm going to skip. 
Stan Mall is the um, basically the latest and also the uh, most complete classification. So it basically divides into uh, three uh, ends of the triangle. So first, uh, polar type one uh, would be the there's a definite history of significant trauma. Then then uh, you, you got unidirectional instability and usually got vancal lesion, mainly your tux falls in this, this polar type one. Polar type two, less definite history of trauma, likely to have structural lesion also, and then got some uh, abnormal muscle patterning. And then polar type three, there is no structural abnormality. And then it's more like a habitual dislocator with significant muscle patterning abnormality. So basically the triangle, you can move around a triangle over the time as the disease progress. And then um, this cascade, it can be tough to decide where the patient falls in the triangle. So this is an example of your uh, standard classification. So as you can see, this is traumatic and structural. It's a type one. Type two, non-traumatic, but still got structural uh, uh, lesion. Type three, basically there is no structural, just uh, mainly due to muscle patterning. So as you move away from your type 3, there's less muscle patterning. Move away from your type 1, there's less trauma. So we start off some clinical history. <clears throat> so basically, the age is very important. As you can see, young patient, second to third decade, decade of life, uh, instability is the most common cause of shoulder pain. So if active sportsman, always need to suspect there's a slap as a differential and also uh, other as, uh, are part of the associated pathology. Other differential diagnosis for this age group would be uh, any history of ACG injury, osteolysis of your lateral end of clavicle in a weightlifter. So uh, young patient, basically the main cause is to be shoulder instability. Next age group with your fourth and fifth decade uh, patient, which is a uh, subacromal impingement, frozen shoulder inflammatory arthritis is more common. Uh, more than 60 decades would be uh, rotator cuff tear, degenerative joint disease, and bicep tendinitis. So we see old patients, 40 years and above, the more common cause would be impingement, rotator cuff tendinopathy, bicep tendinopathy, and um, ACJ arthritis. So clinical history, uh, usually we ask about their occupation, their hobbies, the age is very important, and then uh, history of traumatic shoulder dislocation, whether uh, CMR is done in the ED or in OT, uh, whether there's any x-ray confirmation, need to determine whether the dislocation is anterior or posterior, uh, if got records. Then need to determine whether this is the first time or already have multiple episodes, any significant trauma event or just a subtle complaint of ongoing shoulder pain with a certain activity or position, any history of physiotherapy and how was the response, any history of surgery done before. So your history basically taking will coincide uh, all this, which is your age, level of sport, type of sport. So that's why you need to ask about all this. So, so you can grade your instability, severity index score, which is IFS, which will explain later. So types of shoulder instability can divide into anterior instability, multi-directional instability, and also posterior instability. So anterior mainly usually is your tops, multi-directional is your embry, umbri, and then a posterior insertion is your usual posterior dislocation. So we start out with uh, tops. So basically, uh, I already mentioned earlier, traumatic, unidirectional, banker, and so surgery required. So usually more common is age group less than 20 years. Younger, the younger the age of presentation, the higher recurrence of your dislocation. So mechanical injury basically is an anterior directed force with the shoulder in abduction and externally rotated. So associated injuries with tux is basically uh, divided to your labor and cartilage, which is banker lesion, which is a lesion at the anterior inferior. So usually involves your anterior band or anterior glenna. Then you got your humoral abortion of glenoid humoral ligament. <coughs> this one uh, need to identify because if it's not repaired, there is high uh, recurrence rate. And then uh, glenite labral articular defect basically is a lesion at your banker, but the part of the labrum and cart cartilage surface is uh, shaved off. And then uh, you got your ALPSA, which is anterior labral periosteal stiff abulsion, 
This one is basically uh, a sugar diagram. Um, your clenoid is, your labrum is uh, about and then it went medial to your clenoid and it heals at the middle side. So next would be your rotator cuff test, about 30% uh, of patient in more than 40 years age. Then uh, don't forget about any uh, fractures or bony defects, such as bony banquet, <clears throat> also at the anterior inferior part of the clenoid. So any defect more than 20% is considered critical bone loss and highly unstable. And then present a heel sac lesion. Heel sac lesion basically is at the lesion of your humerus head at the posterior lateral aspect when it indent onto the glenoid. Uh, greater tuberosity fracture, lesser tuberosity fracture. Then uh, last will be your neurovascular uh, nerve, nerve injury, axillary and muscular cutaneous nerve. So what is banker lesion? Uh, anterior inferior, as I mentioned earlier. So you can see that the labrum is uh, detached on the anterior, anterior inferior part. On the MRI, you can see there's a there's a lesion um, detachment of the labrum over this part. Uh, and you can see this part don't have any detachment, but over here you can see the detachment. And this one is the bony bank involved the glenoid bone. So this is a diagram I mentioned. This is a normal glenoid and labrum with a periosteal. And then uh, over here is a bank where the, you can see that the labrum is separated from the glenoid. Then uh, this glad lesion basically, as uh, I mentioned earlier, a pillar cartilage loss on top of your uh, banker lesion. And then uh, protein lesion is basically just there's a barrier of the stripping here. And ALPSA is basically a protein, but the, but the uh, labrum was, will dislodge on the medial part of your glenoid and then it heals at this position, it will cause uh, reduced external rotation later. Bony banker basically a fracture through your lemma. So presentation usually came with pain, reduced range of motion, loss of deltoid contour, prominent acromion laterally, prominent humeral head anteriorly, the arm usually in external, partially external rotated and adducted position. So examination wise, uh, some of the signs is a uh, soccer sign, apprehension test, relocation test, and need to check uh, your baton score at the end of the examination. So this is your load shift, also known as the drawer test. You see uh, one hand holds the clavicle and uh, the scapular spine to stabilize it, while the other hand holds on to the humeral head and then um, translate anterior and posterior, translate the humerus head anteriorly and posteriorly. So grade zero is normal translation, Grade one, the humerus head up to the will move translate up to the glenoid rim. Grade two, it went over the glenoid rim, but once the force is removed, it's spontaneously reduced. Grade three, the it went beyond the glenoid rim, and then it's locked there, so it doesn't spontaneously reduce. Salker sign basically uh, shows inferior instability, so. Uh, over here, you can see the soccer sign. So basically, just hold on to the arm and uh, apply a downward uh, traction force. And you can see the presence of the soccer sign. So basically, group into grade 1, 2, and 3. 1 is uh, less than 1 cm, 2, 1 to 2 cm, 3 is more than 2 cm of your common humeral distance. So other uh, tests would be your apprehension and relocation test. So <clears throat> you can see in the diagram, basically, you abduct the arm with the elbow flex in 90 degrees and then externally rotate. So uh, it's positive when patient shows apprehension on the facial expression, meaning that uh, can feel that the shoulder joint is dislocating. Whereas uh, relocation test, you apply a downward pressure and repeat the apprehension test. As you can see, there's no, uh, with the stabilizing of your downward pressure, patient does not have any apprehension sign. So this one indicate anterior instability. So Baton score basically there is nine points. So four, four, uh, eight of the points is from your right and left hand, right and left thumb, right and left elbow, right and left knee, and the last nine nine point will be your uh, whether you can put your hands both flat on the floor with the knee straight. So the First hand one would be whether there's this 90 degree of your fifth uh, little finger extension 
and then whether your thumb will be able to touch your forearm, whether there is 10 degree hyperextension of your elbow, and whether there is hyperextension of your knee. So any score of uh, four or more indicate hyperlexity. So imaging wise, uh, your plane radiograph, AP view, scapular Y view, axillary view, special uh, X-ray view will be your west point to look for banker lesion, striker notch to look for heel sex lesion. CT scan to evaluate any bony injury, MRI to look for the labrum and also ligament injury. So what is a west point view? Basically, this is the position, supine position, 25 degree from the center and then um, downward 25 degrees with the cassette place uh, at the superior part of the shoulder. So you can see the west point view can visualize the glenoid to look for any uh, banked lesion. Heel sex basically is a lesion on the uh, humerus head, on the posterior lateral aspect. So it can be best viewed with the striker notch view. Basically, uh, just supine position with the cassette at the back of the shoulder, with the arm, with the hand placed on the head, and the X-ray beam directed uh, 10 degrees uh, cranially. So you can see the, in, the lesion of the heel sac over here. So the <clears throat> for the humeral avulsion of general humeral ligament basically means that uh, the avulsion of your anterior inferior glenohumeral humeral ligament from the attachment to the humerus. So usually on MRI it's supposed to be a U shape here, but due to it did, uh, it avulsed from the attachment side to the humerus, so it became like a J. So this J is more, you can see this is the J. So it's supposed to connect the initial, normal would be a U, but because it's dislodged here, so it became like a J. So treatment, we start off with non-operative. So any dislocation did need acute reduction. Then assess your neurovascular status before and after reduction under adequate sedation. Immobilize and physiotherapy. So immobilize for three weeks, pendulum exercise for three weeks. And then after that, after three weeks, and then after that, full hour and then after six weeks. So risk factors for re-dislocation are age younger than 20 years, male, contact spots, uh, pressure for hyperlexity, glenoid bone loss of more than 20%. So you can see almost 100% if it's less than 20 year old, 20 to 40 about 50%, and then more than 40 is only 10%. So elderly is less likely to re-dislocate. So I mentioned just now in uh, injury uh, instability severity index score. So it's score of um, <clears throat> it's basically to evaluate the outcome of uh, treatment with arthroscopic uh, repair. So basically uh, they give you scoring of points and then uh, based on the age of surgery, less than twenty or more than twenty level of sport whether it's competitive or recreational type of sport any contact or without contact spots, and then clinical examination present on hyperlexity or no hyperlexity, and then x-ray whether got huge set lesion or not, then whether there is a glenite, the contour is lost or not. So uh, types of CMR, there's many methods uh, for to CMR your anterior dislocation. Mainly this is traction, counter traction method, hypocrites method, and then this Stimson method prone with the uh, weights on it and then coaches method uh, fallen out of favor because of uh, uh, high risk of uh, fracturing your glenoid and then each method is uh, very high success rate and then very uh, low chances of uh, complication but uh, can be a bit uh, complex so the maneuver basically are uh, axial traction and then um, the other thumb stabilize the humerus head and then uh, abduct and uh, forward flex. So once the heart arm is abduct abducted and forward flex, and then the humerus with the stabilized by the thumb, humerus head stabilized, the thumb will eventually fall into place. So next we go to operative. So it's indicator for young recolor dislocation. Uh, it is an open dislocation or the dislocation is irreducible and the disabling signs 
and then high demand or expectation patient. So re-dislocation after surgery is less than 10%. So surgery-wise, you can divide into anatomical and non-anatomical. So anatomical, you got your arthroscopy, mental repair, and then uh, can be either arthroscopy also open. Non-anatomical will be your coraca transfer, transfer, mainly your lethargic and bristol procedure. Then plissage for uh, heat set effect, and then uh, can use bone graft, whether autologous or allograft, and arthroplasty for old patient with uh, bony banker more than 40% deficiency. So surgical considerations, whether there's any large bony glenoid defect more than 20%, <coughs> usually in uh, present in recurrent dislocation. <coughs> so patients that have multiple dislocation need to think about the glenoid defect, which can be more than 20% or chronic cases. CT scan is therefore very useful to check the, about this uh, defect. So this will determine whether there is need to do any bony procedure instead of your usual capsule labral back repair. So now therefore the letter jet bristol procedure when got more than 20% glenoid bone loss. So because if you don't address this 20% bone loss, the your usual capsule banker repair got 60% of re-dislocation. But if you do letter jet, the it came down to 4%. Check if there is heel sac lesion engaging at the edge of the glenoid ring during your arthroscopy. So because if it's um, engaging at the edge, it's stuck at the edge during your arthroscopy uh, examination and you did not address this heel sac lesion, uh, your repair will most likely fail. So if there is presence of a humeral avulsion glenoid humeral, uh, no, humeral avulsion glenoid humeral ligament lesion if present, you need to be repaired together with banker lesion, usually by an open technique, although because the arthroscopic technique is uh, very technically demanding. So for Umbri group, you can fail in it uh, can be either in the polar stemmore polar 2 or polar 3 group. So usually they treat with conservative first. So surgery if there is presence of a structural defect after trial of physio. Stemma polar 2 can have a unidirectional requiring banker repair or multidirectional requiring your capsular shift, inferior capsular shift. But Stemma polar 3 don't have any structural abnormality. Therefore, it's not indicated for surgery for the polar 3 group. So, we start off with the banker repair. <clears throat> so, basically, arthroscopy banker repair, um, you, your portal of viewing portal will be the same from the posterior. And then um, anterior portal will also be the same with the guide of a needle. You insert a needle of lateral to your coracoid process uh, just below the AC joint. And then when you insert the needle, you might make sure it's in the rotator interval. <clears throat> so once uh, the viewing portal is done, you need to visualize a 15-point diagnostic scope to look for all the, uh, any look to go through your diagnostic. And then uh, evaluate heel sac size and check whether it's engaged. And then um, follow down to your uh, banker lesion, mobilize the labrum and free the tissue around this area. And then debride all the fray tissues. And then uh, raw the glenoid rim. And then subsequently, we start with the first uh, anchor suture, which is uh, inserted at 5 o'clock. So drill at 5 o'clock. And then insert the anchor suture with two strands. Two strands. So uh, then take one of the strands and put it to your suture passer and grab your uh, labrum and also your inferior glenohumeral ligament and also capsule. So it peels from the outside of the, one strand will go from the outside of the capsule to inside and the other will remain inside. Then you tie it together, tie it with the knot, knot pusher. So repeat uh, with the second and third angle suture around 1 cm above the previous. 
So as you can see here, this is a banked lesion. So need to debride all these uh, forever tissues and then uh, drill a hole and then insert your anchor suture. One end you pass through the capsules with your suture passes. The other end is in the, from the inside and then you tie them up and then you will just pull everything to the uh, glenoid rim. So followed by the second one and then third one if needed. So what is inferior capsular shift of glycation? Basically, you can see your capsule is uh, lax. So basically, you do a T insertion on the capsule at the anterior part and then um, open up and then you glycate it. That means they overlap each other so it became tightened. You can see no more, no more recession over here. So, <clears throat> next surgical procedure, which is your letter J. So, basically, it's a coracoid process with their conjoint tendon attached, is transferred to the anterior inferior glenoid bone defect. So, conjoint tendon mainly is, is your uh, short head of biceps and the uh, coracobrachialis muscles. So, this one will improve the glenoid bone coverage. And then the conjoint tendon acts as a sling. So it, the capsular reinforced with your crocodile ligament. The difference between the jet and Bristol procedure, Bristol is just to take the tip of the crocodile and the conjoint tendon, whereas the jet it took the whole crocodile process. So you can you see the diagram. Uh, over this side is a, this one will be your jet because it takes uh, the whole piece of your crocodile process and then uh, screw the bone is parallel to your glenoid. Whereas uh, for Brisco, it only take the tip. So you see in like this diagram, it's just a tip and just one screw to hold. So we start off with letter jet. So basically how to do a letter jet procedure, usually we do uh, using open method. Uh, because the uh, arthroscopic method can be challenging and technically demanding and longer operating hour. So open technique, basically your skin insertion is from the tip of the coracoid, <coughs> about uh, 4 to 5 centimeter towards your axillary crease. And then uh, your superficial structure will be your cephalic bay, which is retracted laterally. And then dissect following your delta pectoral uh, interval. So dissect between your deltoid muscle and also your pec major. So internal nervous plane will be axillary nerve for your deltoid and then uh, medial and lateral pectoral nerve for your pectoral major. And then you abduct and external rotate the arm, maintain the abduction and external rotation to tension your coracoacromial ligament. So you cut the coracoacromial ligament 1 cm from the attachment to the coracoid. Okay, I can see this is your skin incision for your approach. So basically it's your delta pectoral approach. So directed from beginning from your coracoid downwards to uh, in the direction of your axillary crease. So underneath is your pec major and also your delta and also capillary vein. So under between your delta and your pec major will be uh, you eventually visualize your uh, subscapularis uh, muscles. So you can see that the neurovascular bundles are just um, medial to your coracoid process, which need to be, uh, especially your muscular cutaneous, which goes very close to your glenoid. So mark uh, the minimum 2 cm from the tip of a coracoid with a marker, <clears throat> then partially incise your coracoid human ligament, which is deep to the coracoid ligament, you free the upper lateral aspect of the coronary tendon to release it. Then it did up the arm and internal rotate to visualize the middle aspect of the coracoid to release the back inner from the attachment with the atony. And then use parallel periosteal elevator to release all the soft tissue underneath the coracoid. And then this will visualize the knee of your coracoid, which is the site of your osotomy. So knee is basically where the part of the coracoid that bends later. I'll show the picture later. So osteotome, usually osteotome from medial to lateral using a 90 degree oscillating score. So 
then a dark and external rotate the arm again, hold the coracoid with two forceps, remove any remnants, and then um, gentle dissection order the medial side of the to the content and then to allow mobilization. So need to mobilize your uh osseptum coracoid process. Then the cortical part of the coracoid to expose cancerous bone, which will be uh, attached to the glenoid later. So drill two holes of the coracoid about one cm apart, and then reposition the arm on the side of the body. Then you can expose the subscaparis muscles. You need to identify the superior inferior margin of subscaparis muscles. So at the junction of superior two third and inferior one third, you split your subscaparis muscles. Once after doing that, you can see your anterior inferior part of your glenoid. So uh, clear inside the labrum and periosteum using plate. So we say expose from five o'clock to two o'clock. Then decorticate the anterior and inferior surface of glenoid with a longer or a saw. Then you start your drill at a five o'clock of glenoid for your inferior hole. So uh, you have to be placed sufficiently medial to avoid overhang. Overhang means it's not in the articulating surface of your glenoid. So place the coracoid parallel to your anterior body of glenoid with no overhang. So put in your first screw, usually is a 4.5 mm. Uh, partial traded malleolus screw and then drill in the second hole which was prepared previously and insert the second screw then close in layers so you can see in this diagram <coughs> this you can see this is the knee the, the, the part that it starts to bend and accurately so, so you osteotome over this side then this is the conjoint tendon so you split at the uh, between superior two third and inferior one third, and then attach the coracoid process parallel to your glenoid margin, anterior margin of glenoid. So uh, there's a systemic review uh, to see whether your uh, Latage or your Bristol, which one is uh, better. Um, this in this systemic review. Uh, in the term of recurrence, uh, there is some statistically, statistically significant advantage to bestow technique. But then, uh, although it's statistically uh, significant, but then the clinically, is, uh, the effect size is not uh, significant for clinical differences. And then, um, yeah, basically, it's both the method is considered uh, similar. Then uh, whether open or versus arthroscopic, basically mainly um, outcome is same except that arthroscopy will have a lesser initial uh, post-op plan and uh, post-op pain. So, but then uh, it's more demanding, technically demanding and the procedure take longer time. So there is no evidence to support any significant difference in terms of um, the outcome uh, in terms of the complication, recurrent instability that needs uh, revision surgery. So next would be your remplissage procedure. So this one is basically to repair your field set lesion defect. So as you can see in the diagram, there is uh, usually indicated for more than 25%. So if this lesion is more than 25%, so you need to address it. So the basically it's just putting an anchor suture onto the heel set lesion and then tie and pull the infraspinatus tendon to fill up this uh, heel set lesion gap. Because this gap can actually engage on the edge of your glenoid and cause the uh, shoulder to be stuck and unstable there. So I already mentioned this. This one is basically to predict your uh, outcome of arthroscopic uh, repair. So you need to score this to know whether the whether patient should go for your arthroscopic stabilization or proceed with latage procedure. So a point of more than six indicate a uh, bony procedure. So we we'll move on to our multi-directional instability, which is our embryo. 
So usually common age group will be second to third decade of life due to micro trauma from overuse sports or just generalized uh, ligament laxity such as uh, Ehlers Danlos or Marfan syndrome. Must have instability in at least two planes, either from anterior, posterior, or inferior, to be considered multidirectional instability. So, MRI is basically, um, you can see there is a patulous inferior capsule on MRI, meaning patulous meaning is flat and also thin. And then, uh, rotator interval uh, deficiency, banker lesion can be present in the anterior and inferior lateral tear. Kim lesion is uh, similar to banker, but it's located at the posterior inferior. But it's data I'll show you a diagram, you'll see, tell you what's the difference between Kim and the banker. So clinically, uh, pain, instability, weakness, crepitus, and then uh, maybe the interview when you sleep. So Kim lesion, according to Kim paper, this says that the lesion is uh, superficial. Eh, the lesion is uh, intact superficial portion, but the deep is uh, not intact. But uh, radiology-wise, they say the superficial is not intact, but the deep is intact. But basically, because um, when you look through the arthroscopic, according to paper, when you look through arthroscopic, so when you look from the through the arthroscopic view, you don't see the lesion because the lesion is under the under on the outside of the later show picture with you. Okay, so you can see that this picture, um, the glenoid and the labrum. So from the inside, you don't see because the lesion is from the from the back here. So, so I'm not sure whether you say whether it's, this one is deep or this one is superficial or the other way around. But for Kim, he explained using it as intact superficial, torn deep. But if you read your wife, they'll say that it's outside the consider superficial. So they say torn superficial, intact, intact deep. So yeah, mechanism basically is uh, the force coming from the outside towards uh from the medial to laterally, so it evolves on the outside, but the glenoid surface, glenoid labrum part is still intact. So preserve control labor junction. So as I mentioned, the same sulcus sign, apprehension, relocation test, anterior posterior load sheet, and return score. Plain radiograph usually is normal. MRI can show a patulous inferior capsule, rotator interval deficiency. Banker or Kim lesion. Arthroscopy will have a positive drive through sign because the whole joint is uh, lax. So, treatment mainly non operative is a first line, usually three to six month regime. Strengthen your rotator cuff and uh, pericapsular muscles. Operative indicated when uh, you feel conservative or the pain and instability is affecting the daily activity. Contra indicator for voluntary dislocator. So, some patients they can voluntarily dislocate their shoulders and relocate back. So it's not indicated for surgery. Then procedure can be either done using an open or arthroscopic uh, capsular shift. So posterior, next our topic will be, uh, next will be the posterior shoulder instability or dislocation. It's very uncommon and if present, it's frequently missed in your emergency department. Risk factors is basically a uh, limit same as a uh, ligamentous laxity, bony abnormality, such as your glenoid retroversion or hypoplasia, commonly associated with seizure or electric shock. Mechanism is a uh, adduction and internal rotation. So you can see the right side is a uh, normal upper limb and the left side is the abnormal one where there is uh, unable to externally rotate and then the arm is adducted. So posterior instability can present with pain. The arm, uh, <coughs> arm is in uh, adduction and internally rotated, and then reduced range of motion. That means cannot lim limited external rotation. Shoulder often uh, locked in internal rotation. Signs wise, uh, coracoid will be prominent. And then uh, posterior shoulder also will be prominent fullness. Then you do your usual uh, posterior 
load and shift test, posterior drawer test, jerk test, kin test, and posterior apprehension test. So what is jerk test? Basically, stabilize uh, one hand on the scapula, while the other hand holding the elbow, abduct the arm to 90 degree, with, and then apply internal rotation, then apply firm axial force towards the glenohumeral joint, and and then uh, horizontally adduct, that means from uh, adductor position, turn the horizontally AD duct it while maintaining your axial force. <coughs> and uh, you can feel that the, the shoulder will, uh, will move backwards. So Kim test, we see is similar to jerk test, but uh, it's angled at a 45 degree uh, downward, uh, downward Force, but the hand instead of stabilizing the scapula is put onto the hold onto the arm, applying a downward and a posterior force on the upper arm. Okay, posterior apprehension test basically. So you just place one arm at the posterior of the shoulder, internal rotate and apply axial axial load. So patient will feel. Uh, apprehension, so feels like it's dislocating. So in uh, imaging wise, your usual plane radiograph AP view uh, can see light bulb sign, but it's not reliable. Axillary is the best view. Uh, Valpeal view if the patient cannot adapt the arm for axillary view. CT scan to analyze location and extent of bone loss in a chronic dislocation. Anything more than two weeks is considered chronic, so we need to evaluate uh, extent of bone loss. Then MRI to check for uh, any uh, labral tear, reverse heel sac lesion, or any rotator cuff tear, and it also can demonstrate a uh, Kim's lesion. So on the left side is your light bulb, sun looks like a light bulb, and then this one you can see is a slow view, it's dislocated from the usual side. Valpeal view is done uh, in this position in case you cannot do axillary view. So treatment, non-operative would be uh, CMR and immobilize for about four weeks. Then after six weeks, you start your physio strengthening. So indicated it is a first episode. So type how to CMR, basically uh, vertical traction and uh, apply external rotation. So it will usually spontaneously reduce. So immobilize in external rotation, basically these are some of the methods to keep it in external rotation. Okay, so we next we move on to operative. You got your open or arthroscopic posterior labor repair, open or arthroscopic posterior capsular shift, Rotator interval closure, not really proven yet. And then hemiarthroplasty and open reduction with uh, subscapular muscle trans uh, sub -scapular transfer, which is uh, known as McLaughlin. If you take the subscapularis together with the lesser tuberosity, it became a modified McLaughlin. Then uh, posterior glenoid opening wedge osteotomy is mainly for uh, congenital glenoid retroversion cases. So we start off uh, with reverse banker repair. So indicated in recurrent instability, continue pain with uh, forward load. So meaning like you do your bench press and foot blocking a football, so you can feel pain. Then 80% uh, success rate, open is similar to your arthroscopic repair, success rate. And then a uh, posterior capsular shift when the baton score is uh, more than four. Okay, we start with a uh, modified McLaughlin. So basically, you transfer the lesser fibrosity humerus with the attached subscapularis to the defect on your reverse heel set. So it's indicated for chronic dislocation, but it's less than six months old. And then a uh, reverse heel set lesion, which is less than 50%. So we see on the surface, the uh, acceleration is less than 50%. And uh, it's a chronic discussion, but not more than six months old. 
So this is a gap picture of how the Hillside Vision <coughs> engage and get stuck to your to your uh, planet, planet ring. So Ming Wen, Ming Wen. So this one is not only the posterior instability. This hmm. this is the I mentioned in the clinic just now. This is the lock posterior dislocation. Lock posterior dislocation. Yes, from from the picture here. Okay. Maksudnya the the shoulder is actually dislocated. Hmm. Uh, chronic uh, posteriorly, it doesn't go inside the glenoid. Hmm. Uh, so they stuck macam tu. Is that's why you have option of uh, hemi arthroplasty in certain in certain injury. Hmm. Okay, so yeah, so modified McLaurin need to uh, is basically can see the non modified McLaurin you need to take the attachment of your subscapularis muscle and to fill up the gap, but the modified one you take part of your um, uh, lesser uh, humeral tuberosity together with the attachment and then it to fill up the gap in this picture. So can I use a screw or use your Anchor switches. So reverse uh, remplissage procedure to fill up the defect. Uh, still limited uh, literature about it. So just like the remplissage for your anterior instability, uh, anterior uh, your normal heel set lesion in anterior dislocation, but this one it goes through your subscapularis instead of your infraspinatus. So it's still not uh, much literature on it uh, available at the moment, or mostly a just case report. So hemiarthroplasty basically indicated for chronic dislocation more than six months, severe humeral head arthritis, collapse of humeral head during reduction, and then a uh, reverse heel set lesion of more than 50% of your articulating surface. And then uh, total shoulder for significant glenoid. That means if it involves your glenoid, then you go for total. If it's just a humerus hit, then you go for hemi. Then, um, okay, so basically why chronic, why chronic you go for uh, hemi arthroplasty? Because uh, there is no contact between the humerus and the glenoid. So the humerus will basically uh, become uh, osteopenic and then uh, because lack of uh, load on it. So once after prolonged time, it became soft and then when you locate the humerus, it can actually collapse. So surgical complication, um, basically um, recurrent instability is the most common. Then followed by adhesive costillitis, generalized stiffness, over tightening of a posterior capsule can lead to anterior instability or impingement over the coracoid and then uh, lead to degenerative joint disease, uh, nerve injury, mainly or axillary or suprascapular nerve. Mm, that's all. Any question? Okay, go to the to the initial, I mean the first few slides. So shoulder instability mainly like like uh, Mingguan said, ninety percent, ninety five percent is anterior, right? Mm. So if you go uh, according to the direction, that the anterior, inferior, and posterior. So that that few causes of posterior dislocation, that five percent, you should know. Can contoh dia ada apa? Kalau dia di injury direct blow to the shoulder, uh, from the uh, apa full extent apa? Fuss, fuss injury again, and then you have electrocuted, electrocuted, and then uh, another one is double scissors. Kalau patient ada epilepsy, then you must suspect there is a posterior dislocation. Kalau dia di injury to the to the shoulder. Mm -hmm. So paling common sekali is uh, your anterior instability. So selalunya uh, it's quite easy for uh, apa to differentiate between yang pathological ataupun non-pathological kan. Maksudnya pathological, when you examine the patient, patient has symptom, you, you examine the patient, patient had a positive sign and then you you do MRI or, or, or MRA because uh, if you want to see labrum kan, anterior, superior labrum and posterior 
anterior inferior posterior you should do for uh, MRA MR atogram kan MR atography then you can see the labral torn maksudnya kalau you do MRI there's a pathological uh, then of course this one you you apa you 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 need to treat the pathological and then let's say patient uh, come with multiple time dislocation anteriorly with sign of leg GT and then you do MRI there is no an anatomic there is no an pathological punya lesion so you might classify this under apa and then the direction is uh, two or more you might classify this under multidirectional so you you go the Ambri punya side kan as classified dalam classification tu lah so itu direction lagi satu the age the age for example if 20% or less so the, the the risk of dislocation is how many percent 20 90 uh, almost 100% right almost 100% rate of dislocation that's why they 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 are the they are the debate on acute dislocation kan either kalau acute dislocator, do you fix it or you send for physiotherapy, right? Hmm. So most of the time, if less than 20% and eh, less than 20 years old, uh, first time dislocator, contoh dia main rugby ke, main football ke, dislocate and then you do MRI, there's a lesion. So the recommended treatment for this patient is a surgical treatment. You need to repair the, contoh kalau dia ada torn labrum, then you must uh, repair the labrum. Kalau dia ada evulsion, inferior glenoid bone or bangkat lesion, then you must stabilize the bangkat lesion because of the recurrent rate. So when the when the, the, the age become older, so dia punya rate of dislocation is reduced kan? How about patient more than 40 year old? Let's say we have in the clinic just now, right? We have uh, uh, neglected anterior shoulder dislocation. So what is the most common? If this patient is old patient, so the most common is a apa? Rotator cuff tear. So massive rotator cuff tear. A patient might come with dislocation in elderly. Maksudnya not only the, the labrum in elderly is not so important, tapi the the cuff is quite important in elderly in case of dislocation. Uh, besides that, you must rule out is there any body pathology lah. Contoh dia ada anterior labral avulsion ke apa ke kan, or fracture. Then you must look for from your x-ray and CT scan. Okay, patient with, an, contoh anterior instability come to you, is a young patient. Uh, patient cakap dia dah, dia dah, dia dah berapa kali, dah lima kali dislocate. Kan, lima kali dislocate. So how, how, how is your approach towards the patient? Kan, satu you need to take the history of course and then the the, the limb punya apa, uh, dominant and then tengok what's the patient re punya requirement because you need to differentiate either, contoh kalau dia ada pathological right, so you need to differentiate either they just involve the soft tissue or labral tear ataupun they involve the bony Dengar tak? Ha, so kalau kalau soft tissue kalau maksudnya kalau let's say dia baru 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 few time dia dislocate and and the patient need to go to to ED to reduce it cannot uh, reduce by himself most probably kadang-kadang uh, most common they just soft tissue involvement maksudnya anterior inferior labral tear tapi kalau patient maybe over 10 years dislocate uh, multiple time and then until certain time patient able to reduce it so you must suspect apa? Bone. Maybe there ada bony involvement. Maksudnya kalau anterior, kalau anterior uh, instability dia ada anterior inferior glenoid bone loss plus kalau humeral humeral side kita apa panggil apa? Heel sac. Heel sac. So dia ada posterolateral indentation of your humeral head. Kan we call it heel sac. So macam macam mingguan cakap tadi kalau posterior dislocation dia terbalik. Maksudnya dia possible dia ada posterior postero inferior uh, glenoid bone loss plus the uh, anterior medial humerus head. Anterior medial ataupun Inter reverse heel sac. 
uh, anteromedial of the humeral head or river of his uh, Okay, okay, we go back to the, the to the anterior instability. So you, you have to determine that from the history. Maksudnya kalau dia baru few, few time and patient need to go to ED, uh, can reduce it. Uh, most probably the the just soft tissue. Tapi kadang-kadang with high impact, patient might come with uh, apa traumatic anterior evulsion of your anterior glenoid kan. Uh, so you must rule out either the just soft tissue ataupun is a bony involvement. So kalau soft tissue, uh, you need to assess, right? You need to assess. Maksudnya you you kena buat yang yang ayat kita tunjuk dekat klinik kan. How do you assess the anterior instability? You do apprehension. Uh, and then you do your inferior uh, instability by doing your apa sulcus sign and then you do a posterior right so mainly uh, yang yang biasa i follow is a prophrostic punya technique lah i, I examine the patient on uh, on uh, standing uh, we start with your in, apa tu internal impeachment tahu inter, internal impeachment test because the internal impeachment you elevate the the shoulder up to 180 degree abduction and then tengok is there any tenderness or pain the patient uh, will experience or not because uh, in internal impeachment you detect contoh apa kalau patient ada slap tear uh, the internal impeachment will be positive or young patient with apa what lesion can cause internal impeachment pasta lesion pasta uh, partial articular side tear of your supraspinatus. Maksudnya dekat articular side of your supraspinatus tu koyak and then when you elevate the shoulder, dia in contact with your apa? Subacromial space. So it cause pain. So internal impeachment. Then after that, you assess your apprehension. The anterior, anterior, anterior instability by doing anterior apprehension and then for inferior, I, I do the sulcus sign and then posterior, I do the posterior apprehension and do a jerk test. I mean, or the relocation test, kan? So when you push back the elbow uh, axial force towards your shoulder posteriorly, you, you must feel the head. If you can feel the head, means the posterior is unstable. And to, re to recheck, you do a relocation test. Maksudnya, dia sublat ke belakang. When you do re re relocation test, the head of the humerus will jump back into the socket. So you, you can feel the jump over the po posterior uh, glenoid. Okay, that's how you assess. And then not to forget, because the punya labral tear is concurrent, they can extend towards your slap tear, right? Your, your long head bicep tendon punya attachment. So you must assess the long head bicep tendon as well by doing your, selalu I buat dua je test untuk long head bicep tendon. Satu is your, apa? Speed test. Speed test. And then we do O'Brien test. O'Brien. I buat dua je selalu. Like what did, uh, apa tu, our late uh, Frostick did lah. Perform. Okay. So, your differential, kalau, kalau, uh, secara, secara teorinya, instability, yang, yang macam tadi lah, APSA lah, Lebron lah, Bangkat lah. Tapi kalau clinically, you just go for the direction of uh, the injury. Maksudnya kalau ni, uh, contoh the anterior instability of the right shoulder most probably secondary to Hello? Labral tear. Uh, differential could be apa? Could be okay. So Hello. bila you suspect dia dia ada bone loss. So when you suspect bone loss, maksudnya the, from the history the recurrent dislocate banyak kali dislocate and then it become easy. Kadang-kadang pakai baju pun dia boleh tercabut. So you must suspect there is a bone loss. So kalau kalau that that's the history lah. Tapi so, X-ray what you can see you can see. Apa, yang yang the special x-ray just now. The axillary, because banyak orang, apa tu, underestimate the axillary punya view lah. Axillary, you can see the anterior, anterior, apa tu, um, 
bone loss of your from the glenoid and then you must see the hill sac lesion as well uh, so when you do mri mri mr atogram right so kalau kalau if you want like i mentioned previously kalau you nak tengok pathology, pathology inside the glen, uh, glenohumeral joint you must have dye you have you must have atogram otherwise you can cannot see let's say kalau calf use mri normal mri is uh, sufficient kan so kalau you nak tengok uh, in apa intra articular pathology you must put on atogram so the standard is mr atogram for intra articular pathology macam labral tear or slap tear so kena ada atogram lah so bila you buat you you buat atogram you boleh nampak seeping of the dye seeping of the atogram punya contrast into the tear site kan boleh tengok dekat situ uh, dah dah da, ni ai dah ada tunjuk MRI in instability punya patient ke dah explain dah MRI instability patient ah uh, okey okey selalunya bila when you see the MRI you can see the kalau axial view tu you boleh nampak dia punya bone loss so let's say if you think it's significant it's quite big and then you need to quantify using apa you need to order for ct scan uh, ct scan uh, so kena quantify the glenoid bone loss dengan the hill set kan the hill set lepas tu dia ada atroscopic how do you measure the bone loss pun ada so basically orang cakap 20% or 25% you can do if if less than that you can still do a uh, Uh, soft tissue repair okay otherwise if more than that then you need to do for you need to go for bone block either you take from your coracoid uh, or, or lethargy procedure ataupun you take from tricortical bone graft from the elect crest okay you quantify that oh kalau 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 dia just soft tissue then you do you you do soft tissue procedure so kalau dia ada bony bangkat you need to quantify the bony bangkat how much Uh, maksudnya kalau more than 25 then you 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 go for uh, bone bone punya procedure lah. Okay, that's anterior. Posterior uh, sama juga. Posterior uh, kalau kalau they come not come with lock posterior dislocation or they come with just instability, you must assess like I mentioned just just now. Your how do you assess the posterior instability? And then you do MRI, you tengok the posterior labral tear. And then you need to see the bone loss as well over the posterior side, posterior part of your posterior inferior glenoid, as well as your anteromedial part of your humeral head or your reversal side. So you need to quantify lah, tengok kat situ kan. And then I mentioned just now kan, kadang-kadang the shoulder in, in dislocated position. When we when we do AP, uh, it look like normal. So actually when you do uh, shoulder X-ray AP. Uh, dalam dalam slide ni memang dia ada tunjuk bulb sign tapi bulb sign ni kadang-kadang kita pun tak berapa tak berapa sure uh, the axillary kadang-kadang you can see the axil uh, ni axillary or white scapula tapi it's quite painful if you want to do axillary in dislocated shoulder kan so kalau AP selalunya dia 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 on AP selalu kalau normal shoulder on AP shoulder dia ada overlap sikit the articular surface of your head as well as your glenoid tapi kadang-kadang uh, in a in a dislocated posterior dislocated shoulder dia ada gap in between the head and the the glenoid tengok macam mana dia punya inilah x-ray view uh, tapi of course you can do a ct scan or mri to see the 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 apa the uh, position of the uh, joint lagi satu, I mentioned just now and and the, during the presentation, selalunya kalau lock posterior dislocation, dia punya position of the hand is internal rotated, and actually when you ask the patient to to do external rotation, memang dia tak boleh do external rotation. I've got, I think four patient previously uh, miss uh, apa lock posterior dislocation, come after four years, after eight month, so whenever your head is not in the glenoid, you not in the joint, it become osteoporotic very weak it's like like apa tu uh, eggshell that's why you need there's an option no 
uh, apa tu hemi atroplasty to replace the head kan and relocate relocate back the hemi head inside the glenoid okay uh, repair technique the gold standard now atroscopic Astro, atroscopic repair uh, so selalunya uh, me myself kita buat on beast chair so you ada posterior uh, portal untuk viewing portal and then you buat entero inferior dengan entero superior portal anteriorly and then you repair the labrum lah contoh kalau anterior uh, pernah ni tak? you pernah ada case tak? belum lagi belum lagi Uh, so you release the 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 attack apa yang uh, the tear side mana yang uh, you ada apa you banyak uh, dia dia melekat-lekat tu you release and you do a capsular shift you ambil sekali dengan IGHL plicate superiorly kan so you you repair back so you reduce the volume uh, the uh, like oh lagi satu I, I forgot to mention about the ni Uh, apa ni glenoid track concept nanti balik baca pasal glenoid track concept lah sikit engaging non engaging glenoid track concept eh okey you, you repair selalu kita ambil yang paling bawah around 5 6 o'clock ambil with the IGHL selalunya labrum kalau chronic dislocation you don't see any labrum anymore you actually you ambil the whole IGHL and capsular labral complex and uh, plicate back to the to the glenoid surface. So selalunya kita buat saya kita letak tiga tiga apa ni? Tiga anchor suture lah. Selalu I buat paling bawah sekali satu you can with the IGHL and then dekat tengah and superior. So I, I letak selalu tiga lah. Atroscopic. So uh, Last time they do apa? Open, open bangkat repair. It's, uh, it's quite difficult as well because dia punya tempat sempit kan? And then small, it's quite difficult. Atroscopic improve the the the, the ini lah, the the technique. Uh, post repair, selalu you 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 immobilize up to six weeks, so you don't allow you you don't allow the patient for active abduction and external rotation. So after uh, patient will be on brace for six week, then after that you you can off the brace and and uh, uh, rehab the patient. Tapi you have to tell the patient post op. Of course, the initial part of rehabilitation, patient will have uh, limited external rotation. And then because sebelum kita repair tu dia dah the the volume is so high kan, so patient have that lengthy punya range of motion. Tapi when you plicate it, you reduce the volume so it become a bit tight. So during the rehabilitation, you have to work up. After six weeks, you have to work up on abduction and external rotation. Uh, bony, bony just now, the bony procedure selalu kalau uh, small bony defect, so selalu you do uh, letaje, contoh kalau dalam 30% ke 40% uh, persen, then you use letar J tapi kalau bigger than that you might use tricortical bone graft because you can get bigger chunk of bone and you block anteriorly tapi the the, the risk uh, is your your surgical procedure where you don't want the uh, screw that transect the anterior bone tu to your glenoid too proud to the glenoid so kalau dia too proud So nanti your 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 head bila movement of your head dia dia bergesil dengan the bone kan takut bone tu too, too prominent as compared to the native uh, surface of your glenoid nanti takut uh, dia akan jadi apa arthritis secondary to your procedure that's why kalau tengok dia punya ai dah lama tak buat tetra je tapi kalau tengok atroscope uh, apa ni uh, atrak punya set tu dia ada offset kita panggil where you where you have guide put in the in the joint at the anterior surface of the glenoid and they can determine your screw so that your bone graft tu tak tak apa proud as compared to your surface of your glenoid so you can reduce the risk of arthritis uh,
it. Hello. Hello Mas. Ah, sorry. Tadi saya jawab phone je. So, uh, okay. Tadi uh, ni kena baca sikit tri triple effect of your of your lah tadi ya. Lepas tu on the humoral side, uh, on the apa uh, re uh, hill side legion kan. So dia tengok berapa persen of your hill jet dia sama juga lebih kurang Uh, dengan dengan your ni lah dengan your your anterior glenoid kalau heel sac eh, kalau heel sac kan so dia ada prosedur where you close the defect so kalau dia ada rim plesage kan you ada baca pasal, pasal rim plesage dia banyak teknik uh, tapi you can assess arthroscopically kadang-kadang when you repair the, the contoh you decide to, to repair the soft tissue over the anterior inferior glenoid kan you repair the soft tissue And then you must test. You must uh, apa? Uh, external rotate the shoulder. Tengok dia punya dia punya uh, heel set tu dia engage tak the, with the defect and dislocate. So kalau dia tak engage, it's not so important lah to repair. Tapi kalau dia engage, then maybe you need to close up the 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 apa ni? Uh, the uh, heel set, the heel set. Uh, the hill side. Uh, tapi selalunya kalau kalau macam macam uh, I masa dengan frostic dulu, let's say if you do dia uh, ada big bone loss dekat dekat glenoid, uh, ambil tricortical bone graft tampal kat situ, you don't have to do anything on the hill side. Hill side. Tapi ada few patient yang dah dah dislocate berpuluh-puluh tahun, kadang-kadang it's not only the dislocate, they are they develop arthritis of your The, the heel shake so bad, so bad, dia menyebabkan arthritis of the humeral head. So, patient not only dislocate, patient in a normal time pun, without dislocation pun, patient complain of shoulder pain. So, in that in that case, you have to resurface the humeral head. Uh, dia ada satu option. We use a copeland head, we resurface the humeral head. To, 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 apa tu? To elevate the pain from the humeral head. Okay? And then uh, the uh, apa nama dia? Uh, apa? Lagi satu. Oh, lagi satu yang pasal Mac Macaulay tadi kan? Yo, yo Macaulay. Uh, that one for lock posterior dislocation uh, Yang tu tak penting kot Just 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 bear in mind kalau dia ada dislocation posteriorly sama kat macam NC dia Kalau just soft tissue you then you do soft tissue repair the posterior labrum So kalau dia lock posterior dislocation macam tadi kan Lock posterior dislocation Then you need to reduce the head Tengok the time maksudnya kalau chronic Kalau it, head did not viable then you do uh, hemiarthroplasty tapi kalau the head is viable it's a good bone stock then you do the macdolin technique where you close the the anterior uh, mid anteromedial defect of your humeral head so kalau ada 
uh, bone loss on the posterior labrum tu or posterior glenoid you need to put a bone bone apa ni bone bone block lah uh, contoh kalau tengok yang series of uh, siapa ni Imhoff tu dia buat apa corrective osteotomy of your your apa ni uh, scapula version posterior glenoid kan untuk correct the version untuk address your posterior instability uh, I think that's all good and then in in exam kadang-kadang uh, we estimate that the the examiner will ask the high fighting tapi kadang-kadang yang non sport surgeon ni yang surgeon yang tak yang bukan daripada sport uh, punya train kadang-kadang they just ask you the simple thing how do you do CMR how do you assess before you do CMR what is regimental patch kadang-kadang kita forgot about that thing and then how do you which uh, what are the different method of reduce the humor apa uh, the shoulder how you immobilize the shoulder uh, that the what they, they will ask in detail that one you have to prepare lah Uh. Okay ke? Okay Semua dah tidur? Tak Tak ada buat Any question? Bos ada satu soalan bos I think satu topik lah today sebab panjang lah <laughs> ha, Soalan apa? Surai uh, uh, The any diff, uh, the, the Kim lesion and the Uh, reverse uh, bengkak region uh, same bos same more or less the same yeah but the lesion key one is from the outside of the joint ha yeah. uh, the bengkak is from the inside dia macam ni lah dia macam macam ni tadi kan ya. quite difficult apa yang special harga lesion tu kan tapi in 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 practice oh. maybe my uh, posterior Uh, not so many cases kot Tapi I never focus on Kim Legion lah Tapi there's a test, Kim okay. test kan hmm. uh, Kena look up the Kim test, uh. how they how they detect uh, the Kim test Boss, for posterior uh, dislocation The apprehension test and the jerk test, is it the same? So mainly I do Two, I push, I push uh, from post, uh, apa? I will abduct the shoulder uh, 90 degree and in, internal rotate, hold the el elbow again and then push the head posteriorly and you feel the head lah. And then uh, if, if there is instability of the posterior, uh, you can feel the head and when you relocate, you do a jerk test the head will jump on the posterior lip of your posterior glenoid and and it will jump back into the socket that's the posterior yang biasa I buat lah I, I know dia banyak banyak punya version tapi that's what I practice lah the yang anterior drawer dengan posterior dua tadi I think if you do macam on standing macam tak reliable sangat lah tapi maybe if you do on uh, apa uh, supine kan you hold the proximal humerus and push it up and downward and then maybe lah tapi i tak pernah buat yang tu because we do examine the patient all in sending okay so basically we are trying to demonstrate that the shoulder uh, the humeral head is dislocatable posteriorly posteriorly so yes right yes. Applying uh, uh, axial force posteriorly and feeling the humeral head uh, by putting the hand over the posterior. Posterior, yeah. And once it's sublux or uh, dislocated, then we do the relocation yeah. test by uh, tapping the jump. Yeah. Yes. So that that's basically the two tests that we need to do. Uh, okay. Tapi kalau yang lock lock posterior dislocation, the term just now yang tu lain. Yang tu memang the head memang lock and dislocate posteriorly. Macam ada gambar tadi kan, the, the apa tu, the, ah this one, the glenoid stuck dekat head tu, the posterior glenoid, dia stuck dekat anteromedial part of your head, 
and then they become lock satu the bone lagi satu the the pull of the tendon kan satu anteriorly satu posteriorly that's why you reduce it and close the gap using your subscap punya attachment kan or your laser trock okay okay good nak continue ke okay biar dulu kot dah tepu dah ni <laughs> thank you boss Ah, uh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Les. Uh,